And we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Thank you all again for coming. Do you have a lot of snow down there? Or? I think you're muted, Mia. Oh, there we go. We're going to get started. Thank you, Anne. You <laughs> noticed I was talking. I, was I did too, but I didn't know if you were talking to the phone or not. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Good morning. Let me start that over again. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday again. Thank you all for coming today to this uh, presentation of uh, re on racist imageries and mascots um, by a wonderful educator, Ju Judy Dow. It is such an honor to have her here with us today to tell us about the things that she knows. Judy is an indigenous teacher with degrees in education, native studies, and a master's in teaching for social justice. G Judy teaches all of the ages and in countless places in North America. She is also the recipient of the 2004 Governor's Heritage Award for Outstanding Vermont Educator. And she is currently the Executive uh, Director of Gedakina. Did I say that right? I did good? All right, Gedakina is a multi-generational endeavor to strengthen and revitalize the cultural knowledge and identity of Native American youth and families from across New England and to conserve our traditional homelands and places of historical, ecological, and spiritual significance. Yeah. Uh, Judy currently serves on, hold on, Jennifer, you are, can you mute yourself? or I'll mute you there. Um, so uh, Judy currently serves on the Vermont Natural Resources Council, uh, the Vermont Educational Task Force, and the Vermont Climate Change uh, um, Ag, Ag and, and Ecosystem Subcommittee. It is our honor at the Rutland Area NAACP to welcome Judy to this space at this particular time while we are grappling with these issues in Rutland and beyond in the state of Vermont. I also want to encourage anyone listening or participating in this to contact their legislators uh, regarding S-139, which is an act to remove uh, Native American mascots and imagery uh, for, um, and make that um, basically finally illegal in the state of Vermont. So uh, we will be providing some information on the people who are um, the, the senators who are involved with that so that you can contact them and let them know uh, what you've learned today and that you're urging them to push that legislation through. Without any further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to our wonderful educator today, Judy Dow. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Mia. It's nice to be here and I'm kind of excited that so many people would get up on a Saturday morning. It's wonderful, thank you. 
Um, so I want to start off with um, a few invitations and boundaries. Uh, so one would be to listen across differences because the white settler co colonialism, whoops, I got your picture in my way. Hang on, let me close that up. There we go. Colonialism and, and supremacy. We are a wide range of folks. Let's try to move towards each other, not away from each other. We don't want to have to deal with divide today. We want to deal with hugs today. Invited in, we invite you to practice radical hospitality. There's a boundary to keep us out of not nonsense. So let's work to be very hospitable. And, um, and by doing that, we, we don't have to point out what doesn't make sense or what um science has already debunked and the last one is we want to invite you to honor complexity there is boundary against hard assumption so with those invitations we'll move forward um so why should we consider stereotypical imagery and mascots and why should they matter well, there's a few things. In, invisibility in contemporary life creates a, a void that is filled with stereotypes and misconceptions. The latest research shows that the further you are away from knowing Native Americans, the more apt you're, you are to use uh, stereotypical imagery and have a mascot um, where the Rutland area is concerned, um, the homelands of the, of the Mohegan, their tribal headquarters is in Wisconsin, but it's still considered their homelands and they have a tribal office in Western Mass. So you're sort of distant from them. You don't see their history and their activity right in your face. Existing negative narratives are set and controlled by non-natives. So non-natives don't um, have the luxury of, of um, saying the narrative or, or displaying the narrative or telling the narrative. They can often contradict the narrative. But I was, just to give you an example, I was talking with a camp director here in Vermont last week about um, the inappropriate playing Indian things at their camp. And she said to me, we used to be able to sideline voices like yours. And, um, and so she tried, but she couldn't. And that's what we have to do. We always have to, to um, go to confront the negative narrative where we don't have control over that. The narrative overwhelmingly uses a deficit frame. Stereotypical images, imagery and mascots hurt all children. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit as, as we go on psychologically and physically and emotionally, it hurts native children, but all children are impacted because of that void that is, is filled with negative misconceptions. Um, not, non-native children often fill that void with uh, a perspective that's racist or harmful to, to native children. And, and sometimes they actually come away learning how to be racist. Mascots and, um, let's see, mascots and negative imagery hurts native children and causes gener generational trauma. This is something that gets passed on and passed on and passed on. When I was a kid in school in Burlington, we were the Burlington Seahorses and our biggest rival were the little uh, Rice Little Indians. And it was so painful to go to those meetings time after time after time, watching the tomahawk chops and all the other things that they portrayed. Mascots and negative imagery creates an opportunity for non-natives to learn bigotry and racism which can then lead to community development of these same traits. And that's what often fills that void that's created when, when um, 
when indigenous people are invisible, invisible. So let's take a look at some of the images. Um, this is a, a picture of um, from the movie Indian in the Cupboard. And so a lot of our stereotypical in, images will come from childhood favorites like Peter Pan or Indian in the Cupboard. And they just get passed on without people even knowing how problematic they could be. Let's think about that, keeping an Indian in a cupboard, really. Would you keep any other person or any other ethnic group in a cupboard? Um, and those are things to consider when you're, when you're looking at stuff like this. Another big um, problem is um, on our grocery stores, um, on the shelves in the grocery store, we often see um, that, that we are uh, object, objectified as food. <clears throat> so calumet um, baking powder is right up there. And calumet is a French word for peace pipe. And so this is a very sacred object for us and to have it on a can of baking powder is pretty problematic. It's in Land of Lakes and the butter and they've done away with their, um, with their trademark, their branding. So they've taken away the, the um, indigenous woman, but there's been decades, decades of problems with this imagery. Um, and the apples, there's a stereotype out there that some Indian people are just like an apple. They're red on the outside and white on the inside. So this can be very problematic. And then we have bubble gum and we have beef jerky and we have wine with a dream catcher on it. And here in Vermont, we have, um, well, I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, another area that we are often portrayed in a negative way is we're romantic, romanticized. And, you know, look at uh, everything you see about Pocahontas. Um, Pocahontas, it was a 13 year old girl and um, and like the picture of her paddling the canoe, um, this was a 300 pound dugout canoe. There's no way she could have pushed it down to the shore and paddled it herself. And so all these wonderful romantic um, things come of this 13 year old child. And um, believe me, there's um, bald and overweight and everything else you can think of Native Americans, we, we're not all as beautiful as, as Pocahontas is portrayed. Um, and then there's uh, people wear, uh, wearing um, think, clothing and having toys that portray us as a warring culture. And um, it's difficult to uh, see some of these things. Um, I have a Halloween costume, it's a, a metal thing goes over my head. On one side is a, metal net, a point of a knife. The other side is the handle. And so behind it on the, on the paperwork is um, an Indian's head. So you can see, you know, everything, um, a lot of children's toys are out there to portray us as warring people, as fighting people. And um, of course, like every other cultural group, there's all different kinds of people. There's warring people, peaceful people, and loving people. Um, let's play Indian. There's tons of things out there. Lots of toys to dress up and play Indian Halloween costumes. There's a little knife thing I was talking about. You put it over your head and, um, and it's supposed to be like a knife went through your head. And, um, and kids actually dress up and play. And what do they do when they dress up and play? The first thing they do is woo, 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 woo. they start that warring game where they're gonna fight. This uh, um, reappropriating art and some of it is sacred and to bring it into a classroom is very offensive to some people. Um, 
over on the right hand side, we have sand painting, which is an original uh, a, an, an activity done by Southwestern people. You know, it's part of a prayer ceremony. Um, and here we have a couple of animals dressed up as Indians. And over here we have um, an activity book by put out by Saint Labrea, which is a um, a school in Minnesota that um, they um, they were a boarding school and they boarded Native people and Native children and they make all these things that um, ha they have been making all these activity things since probably the 20s or 30s to pay for um, what's going on at, at their boarding schools and the native people who are there. So this particular activity book allows you to cut out paper dolls and make a village and play with them like they were to like the people were actually toys. Uh, appropriation is all about appropriating uh, our clothing, our culture, our spiritual, our written words, um, all kinds of things are, are appropriated. Many, many times I've had to take on um, big organizations, um, big magazines, New York Times, places like that where they have copied my papers and never given me um, recognition, the fact that they were my papers. And so again, some of these things like the tomahawk, when you appropriate them and you make them and you give them to children, the same thing happens again. They start playing Indian. And commercializing um, the um, items, we see our faces on everything plates, dolls, nutcrackers. Um, these two dolls right here, um, the, the young lady and the young man, they come from St. La Brea, the one I was talking about with the activity book. They've been giving these out to people who make donations for decades. Um, and then, then um, branding becomes uh, dehumanizing. So over here, we have a bust of a man that is from the Shamit Bank. Um, we have uh, a paper roller for cigarettes for, with the brand Geronimo. And here in the middle, this sticker, um, I was in Minnesota and was on the doors of every Caribou Coffee they accept Visa, MasterCard, Explorer, and so on, but they don't accept beaver pelts as if um, native people are so backwards, they don't have MasterCard and Visa, they um, want to trade by beaver pelts. And in Minnesota, there are quite a few tribes. Um, and Minneapolis, all the caribou coffee shops in Minneapolis had this on their door. And I say had this on their door because I went to all of them and took them off their door. Um, but that, um, but any given time, there's 35,000 indigenous people in Minneapolis that have come from the reservations to work for a while and then go back to the reservation. So it's pretty problematic to see things like that. We have toothpicks and patches and cigarettes and and fluffy toys and Legos, all kinds of toys. Um, and to be branded um, as an object or as a thing um, is, is quite hurtful and painful. Again, dressing up, t-shirts are everywhere, everywhere. This um, Colorado Historical Society comes from a children's book called 10 Rabbits in which all the rabbits are lined up and counted. And for um, elementary school children who are learning to count, it's perfect thing, it's simplistic. There are a few words on the page, one little rabbit doing this, two little rabbits doing that. But the problem again is we have been objectified. We have been um, wrapped up in a blanket and portrayed as a rabbit. 
And again, the noble savage, um, that is a stereotype that's out there that um, portrays people as um, always being noble and savage-like and um, strong. And like any other group of people, we have all kinds of people. And um, this little baby bib for first Thanksgiving has the happy pilgrim and the happy Indian dressed as bears. And again, we're objectified, just like the t-shirt over here on the left. And, um, and it was first Thanksgiving was not a happy time to play. It was a time where alliances were being forged and, and real estate issues were being solved. Um, it was a coming together to negotiate a lot of different things. Um, and a lot of times um, were sexualized. And I was teaching a class at Maryville's High School in California. And the devils down here on the bottom, we were at their school. And I forgot the name of these people, um, but they came to a conference at the devil's hometown, one man wearing this shirt. I thought they were going to um, tackle him. The women were gonna tackle him and take his shirt off, which they pretty much did. They went out in the lobby and got a shirt from their, from their um, community, their high school. And they made him take that one off and put theirs on if he was gonna be a part of the conference because these were two roaring, warring high schools that that were battling it out and when you look at this you can see they sexualized them and um and put all the stereotypes you could think of for them and then wrapped up in rope the devils who were the others and so this battle is something that is portrayed everywhere and again um the sexualization is just so inappropriate um, and, and especially for high school kids, right? They got enough of that on their minds to begin with. They don't need us advertising it for them. Um, then the other, another issue is princesses. Um, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard. Um, my great grandmother was an Indian princess. We didn't have princesses. We do today, we have some contests in which you can um, choose a princess for your, to represent your community, but princesses are not part of our um, <clears throat> culture from the past. And for today, the, to be named a princess is not based on how you look, it's on your skills and what you know of your culture, your history and your language. So it's very different than it was. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, there's a lot out there on the ignorant Indian. They don't know anything, right? Here's your salt and pepper shake, the buffalo meat, do not taste dandy if me no have the pepper handy. And you have that ignorant language where if me no have, you know, people don't talk that way, um, but they, they're often portrayed as stereotypical be, that they can't speak English properly. Venison steak, very tough, if me no get to salt enough. And again, it's, it's all, it, it's language that is just um, portraying. <clears throat> I'm not sure if any of you read um, Sign of the Beaver. It's a children's book that um, is, um, most schools in Vermont have been reading for a very long time. And, um, it's, it's full of this broken language. Um, and you don't see other cultural groups portrayed that way. You don't see other cultural groups portrayed with um, broken language. Um, and, and that becomes really painfully, um, um, very painful because you're portrayed as ignorant all the time. And, it's like, think of, can you think of any other language group where they would do that, where they would literally mock the way they speak? It's just not done. It's not proper. It's not polite. 
and you just wouldn't see it. And now the mascots. The mascots are out there. I think I heard something like 2,000 mascots across the country. And I looked at a map one time as to where they are. And that research <laughs> that I told you about in the beginning, most of them are in places, places where the native people do not have a presence. They're not, they're not vo vocally um, um, present in those communi communities. They may be there, but they may be for many reasons um, being silent. And, um, and so they're usually exaggerated caricatures of, of native people. They're exceptionally um, red or orange. They're very bright. Um, sometimes their, their material objects will be used for representation of them, like a headdress or an arrowhead. All of that is very inappropriate. And it has to do with all of the things that I talked about before this picture. It has to do with objectifying people. It has to do with um, objectifying our ceremonial objects or our important objects. Um, and, it, and again, this is another thing that becomes an issue and becomes very problematic. So lots of times you hear these songs at games and they have um, these words in them, um, the Braves on the war path, the Redskins, the Tomahawk Chop, you've seen that chop, chop, chop timber and they top, top it down. And all of these songs Scalp them, swamp them, we will. Those are all so painful. Um, and I'm not sure if you know the history of scalping, but the history of scalping started with settlers when uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony started to issue uh, proclamations asking and offering to pay 25 pounds for all of our scalps. And um, and so think about that. Think about your family having a bounty on them for living. And the bounty was to take their scalp. And then you see a lot of toys, a lot of games, a lot of books where I is for Indian. And um, of course, it's the sound that teachers want to children to learn by, but so does it. And so does is. So uh, I think teachers are trying to be a little more selective as to how they, um, they use that now, but um, predominantly it was a serious problem in the past. And it still occasionally pops up today. Um, and dressing up us up as Indians, um, I mean, as animals, when you look at, this is the book I was talking about with the t-shirt where they lined all the rabbits up and they dress them up in, in different blankets from different cultures. And you find it in cards, you find stuffed animals. And I don't know why, <clears throat> excuse me, people find it appropriate to see us as animals, but they do. And there's one other cultural group that they do this to. You see it in cards and children's books. And I think you'd be surprised, um, but you see it done with people who have disabilities. And, um, and again, that's not appropriate, but yet some think it is. Um, Language misappropriation, so like use of squaw or buck or how. So like how um, H-A-U-G-H comes from a Southwestern language, it's a greeting, but then it got misappropriated for everybody to mean how, and you get that, that again, that broken choppy language introduced here. And squaw is squaw. It's a 
it's a, a prefix and suffix to denote something that's female. And um, so uh, let's see, like um, Nidoba is friend, Nidobasqua is girlfriend. So it's part of our everyday language. And the Europeans looking for female companionship use that word to me to translate it to mean whore or vagina. And as it traveled across the country, so did the European meaning of the word. But it's still part of our language. It's in our words. It's in our everyday language. There are children that have that name. And so to use that derogatory definition is problematic to say the least. Uh, chief is another one of those words. Um, chief is a uh, European construct. Take me to your leader. Uh, typically for our Northeastern tribes, we had many leaders and they were all in charge of specific things like, like um, war or hunting or elderly. Um, and so they were natural leaders who um, fit well into specific areas that the community needed help with. And so chief, not everybody uses chief. Some tribes use president. Some tribes use chairman um, because it's, it's a US construct. It's nothing that we ever used. And then of course, there's the last of. Um, the last of the Mohegan, the last Indian village. You often you'll see obituaries. He was the last of his kind. He was the last of Beneke. Um, there isn't any last of. Again, <laughs> that's the way um, Europeans can get rid of us. If they say it was the last of long enough, then people will believe it's the last of and invisibilize us. Ecological wannabes. So I'm assuming you guys, some of you will know who this is. Um, Iron Eyes Cody. Uh, he used to be on TV commercials all the time talking about, um, they would show all these rivers and, and uh, land destruction in the background. And then he'd cry and you'd see this tear and, and you'd say, oh, how bad, right? You'd make this connection with native people and the land being one and it's being broken. But Iron Eyes Cody is an Italian. He is not even Native American at all. So um, there's a lot, this also is problematic and it also pops up in a lot of areas. And then mocking spiritual beliefs, again, dressing us up as animals, um, totem poles. Totem poles um, are, are the culture of the people in the Northwest primarily. And um, they have the one close, closest on the bottom is closest to mother earth and holds the rest of the community up. And the one on the bottom is the one most um, sacred to the community. But yet we um, often hear, oh, he's the low man on the totem pole, meaning just the opposite. And the low man on the totem pole is the one that's most revered in, within the culture. And again, the drunken Indian. Uh, another uh, stereotype, another perceived problem. We don't have the enzymes to digest alcohol, sugar, or milk. And, um, and that's why alcohol is so problematic. And here in Vermont, we have uh, Coca Belly Rock Art Brewery. And of course, you may not know this, but Co Coca Belly is the de deity of copulation. Um, so um, to put that and beer together is again, pretty problematic. So I just want to, to mention to you that, um, that these people 
um, these stereotypes and these mascots and these issues um, promote poor performance in all students. In our, in our children, they are often, um, they often have problems with low self-esteem and, um, and don't do well in school. And as I said earlier, for non-native children, sometimes uh, it promotes uh, uh, stereotypes and, and mascots will fill a void where there's in, where they seem to see invisibility and and they end up accepting it as as something that is believable and in reality is racist. Um, and that's the end. So I was hoping we could have a few minutes to have some conversation. Um, I don't know, Mia, you want to lead this or how do yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. I think I did put a, a prompt in the chat that there's an opportunity to ask questions. I certainly have a few, but I would love to open the floor for other people first to just uh, tell us what you think and, and ask Judy. We have her here, her expertise. Let's ask her all the questions we can. Yeah, and I see Abigail already has something. She's an artist um, and art educator in Northeast Kingdom, Danville. Oh, of course, Danville had a mascot for a long time, right? And we are now probably the Bears, awesome. I work with a large group of students, staff, community members, and alumni to bring out this change. I'm, I'm excited, thank you, to learn. I am too, where, where is Abigail? I, I wanna see your face, there you go, <laughs> hi Abigail. Yeah, Danville was a hard fought battle really hard for all. <laughs> um, so thank you for for all your work to make change. That's great. So, thank you, Abigail. Yes. So we do have a question from Julie here. And also feel free to use your, um, raise your hand virtually, raise your hand uh, if you have any questions. Uh, but Julie asks, would you please tell us about Vermont specifically? How are things here? I bet you have a lot to say about Vermont specifically. <laughs> well, um, me and I have been um, working to get S-139 passed in the Senate or H-461. Is it 461? It's in the six, House. H-641, I think. 641. Mm -hmm. And both of them are addressing um, um, mascot issues in different ways. Um, there was a chart that was floating around the emails for a while, and it showed about two dozen mascots in this state, but they weren't all around Native Americans. So uh, there's one, I think, Mia, is it Randolph? Ha that has the galloping um, ghosts, right. and they have a, um, a, 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 someone wearing a sheet on the back of a horse and it's a flowing white sheet. And it appears to be representation of the KKK um, on the back of the horse. And so that one is pretty problematic again. And the and I thing- I believe they got rid of that one uh, in 2020, I believe. They did get rid of it? Galloping. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, good. So who's um, behind? Who's behind? Well, we know a certain, city who's behind, right? <laughs> Which Rutland. is one of the reasons we're here. We had a long battle. We had changed it in Rutland and now we are back to the Raiders. Well, Can you tell us why that one specifically is problematic? Because there's a lot of talk like it's just an arrowhead. It's not racist. So can you tell us how that is? I mean, I can venture from your presentation, but I'd love to hear you, your perspective. Yeah, um, so to me, um, this mascot battle becomes a battle of opinions. Um, oh, we're honoring you. We are, um, this has been our mascot for my grandfather, for my father, and now it is for me. It's historical, we need it. And all of these opinions I've heard over and over and over again. The problem is you're not honoring us 
And it's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter that you're hurting children. You're hurting children, all children, to have a mascot. And, um, and so, so um, the issue is very different, but people don't want to look at it that way. So the history of the, of the Raiders um, is long and, and difficult. Um, I believe they had a headdress at one time and the Raiders over it. Then they had an arrow projectile point with the uh, Raiders over it. Um, I think they also were labeled Red Raiders at one point and dropped the red. Mm -hmm. And so clearly all of that leads to the understanding we're talking about indigenous people. None of that has anything to do with honoring us. Raiders, warring. Remember, I've been talking about warring. And and so I think, um, excuse me, I think it's very problematic. I think just getting rid of, rid of the image will not make a difference because the history is still there. The history is painful, which happened in South Burlington. In South Burlington, they had the rebels and they're like, oh, it's just the rebels. We're not, not saying anything else. But then all of a sudden in the yearbook pictures started showing up when they're running across the field with the Confederate flag. So it's not just a rebel. It has history, it has meaning, and it goes deep. And once that happens, um, it needs to be, people need to um, consider the impacts on all children and not opinions. Agree. And really it goes back, I would say, to the indoctrination that you were referencing in all of the images, which was quite alarming to me to see so many images that we just take take for granted that are just kind of put into our psyche over time, which then that's harmful to, to kids in a way that they're thinking, number one, in Native American people either don't exist or if they do exist, they are better than that there is a hierarchy of people, humans, Correct. that there are some people that are better And that hurts white kids as well to think that they are more superior than other, other, other people. So, and you can see how that indoctrination happens over time, even when you go to the store. So it's a lot. Right. Um, I see that Alice, uh, Alicia, Alicia says, how does it, how does it go to the community as a discussion versus the school through school boards? Good question. I don't know how it does that. I think you, I think there needs to be education in the community. I think the community doesn't understand the problems they're causing. If they, if the community knew they were creating racists with their children, I don't think they would do that. But they don't understand it. And they have to begin to understand. So education. Um, needs to occur first within the community. And then the community with a one like mind can then go to the school board and demand what we want. But it's that divided mindset within the community because of a lack of education that causes the problem. Yes, agree. You That's need- why we're having you here. So we can Thank spread it out you. to everybody. <laughs> we all gonna have yes, to help yes. us. <laughs> I think in Rutland, that's the issue is that it's become the school board thing, right? And only, and it's not, the larger community isn't really talking about it in the way that you just said. I don't, I think that's the problem. It's all caught up with these school board members and last minute votes and things like that. And that's what's concerning me is that it's not a community conversation anymore yeah so that's we're going to develop here (laughs) yes no no this is the start right yes yes but i appreciate your answer judy thank you you're welcome um there was one other question when you're done sorry before that yeah i I was just going to say one more thing um you're stronger as a community um you know if you look at the old quarters 
the eagles holding five arrowheads uh, are 13 um, arrows. And that's because you can easily break one, but you can't so easily break 13, which represents the 13 original colonies. But that comes from the Mohawk people. They're, they were a uh, confederacy of five, now they're a confederacy of six. And their symbol was an eagle holding five arrows. And so if you can make your community stronger, your school board doesn't have a leg to stand on. Amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you, Judy. Ju Judy, so, so um, we skipped a question before Alicia's was one from Jen. And she says, good morning, our high school in Chester, Vermont recently moved to get rid of our Native American image, but has chosen to keep their name, the name Chieftains and Lady Chieftains for their sports team. Wondering what your thoughts are and feelings about that. Sorry, feelings about that. Yeah, and I sort of just addressed that. It's connected with history. And I'm fully aware of Chester. Um, here at Kadakana, we have something called a one shelf book project. And we give uh, about 50 books on Native American um, to schools each year where we, um, where we see a mascot issue or a racist issue. Because as I told you, the research shows that the further the way you are from knowing Native people, the more apt you are to have a mascot. And so we sent 54 books to Chester this year. And um, we tried to send them to Rutland, but we couldn't find a school that would take them. So if anybody out there from Rutland has an idea, let me know. And on our next year, we can do the same thing. We review them for cultural appropriateness and historical accuracy. And most schools love them. So uh, let me know if um, there's somebody that you find in Rutland. But I do um, find that um, just as offensive that they have the lady chieftains and the and the chieftains because of the history. The history was based on Native Americans and that doesn't go away. And you have to know the past to understand today before you can direct the future in a good way. And you'll never direct the future in a good way if you don't listen to the history. Okay. There's another question here from Allison. She says, I know the Senate Ed committee is considering making the state board of ed the ultimate decider on whether a mascot is okay or not. Do you think that, do you see that as problematic? Well, that's the S-139 that we're talking about. And there's a couple of things in S-39 that um, I don't agree with that I would, but I want to see the bill pass into the house so the house can tear it apart and fix it basically. Um, but one of the things is um, one Native American chief asked that they have the right in their tribal schools to have a Native American image um, and in the schools that their children go to. So we don't have tribal schools here we have schools that the native children go to, but that's just as controversial. All over this country, there are native American um, school, uh, schools with racist native American mascots and other tribes are coming down on them and saying, you may not find it offensive, but we do get rid of it. So the battle is happening all over the country um, and so how, how would you limit that? If you allow that to happen for a native person, would you uh, then allow um, somebody who represents the African-American culture to say, I want the N-word used in our school mascot. And of course, all the Afri other African-Americans are gonna say no, but there's hundreds of opinions from any one ethnic group. And so when they, the loudest get their voices put into the bills, then it becomes problematic. And so S-139, although I want it to go through so it can be changed and I have spoken out 
at the, the meetings to, to change that component, they won't do it. So we have to, they have to hear from people. They have to, they has to get to the floor and pass and go to the house and let the house tear it apart. There's more people there. There's more um, opinions and um, hopefully we, we can get it changed. So support S139 knowing we're gonna support it for change. <laughs> to be changed when it, when it goes through crossover. You know, which brings us to our next question, Judy, which is how can we help? What are some specific steps? I have heard several, uh, including education, what we're doing here today, um, and, um, and obviously trying to get this legislation passed. Is there anything else? Well, you know, um, this, this may sound rude, but um, I have been to Native presentations where people have spoken and they were not appropriate. They were not someone you should be listening to, but because they were Native American, the whole group was listening. And, um, and what happens to Native people who don't believe they should be hearing what is being said, they, in the group, they stand and turn their back to the speaker. And that is extremely rude, but it works. <laughs> and I can imagine a school board meeting and someone speaking and half the room standing and turning their back on them and saying nothing. Sometimes not saying nothing and doing nothing is more powerful than trying to counter what the person has said. Because do you remember when I said in the beginning, we wanna eliminate nonsense? What those people are saying is nonsense. And show that it's nonsense by standing up and turning your back to them. That may seem radical, I'm sorry, but. Well, that sounds like community organizing to me and direct action and protest and we do that. Uh, in different ways. So I think that that is another. Yeah, I see that Ann says in Mill River school board member did that to the public speaker, got a complaint then lodged against them. A school board member should get a complaint because they're appointed and they should be representing everybody and they should be listening to everybody. They should never turn their back to a constituent, never. But the constituents sure can turn their back on the school them, board, yeah. which is what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, yes. Um, let me see, where are we at? Um, I think, uh, okay, we, let's go before. It's so difficult when community member, members see nothing wrong and using indigenous oh, name, imagery, in fact, they feel righteous in their beliefs that they are honoring a group of people. Um, one of the things I've been saying to your representative for about eight, two years now is you need to get the Mohegan people in there to speak. They are, that is their homeland. They are the people who live there. And that's not happened. Um, and those people feel righteous and they feel like they're honoring because nobody's told them, you're not honoring us. They need to be told that. And um, of course they will have excuses, they always do, but that comes down to opinions again. And opinions are not what's needed here. Truth is what's needed here. And the truth is this is harming our children. And we don't want to harm our children. Does that answer your question, Abigail? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it was more of a comment. I mean, we are we're at the point where we're our school is no longer represented by that offensive name, but there still is a, a good portion of our community that I think has no idea why anyone is, you know, why anyone thought it should be changed. Julie, right. well, you, do you have the psychology on that? I mean, I thought it's a weird way to put that is, but what is like, why are they holding on so deeply? I have, I have an idea, but I don't want to put that, uh, my idea. I know 
I know why racism holds on hard in any realm. Um, but is there any kind of thing that you can add to that? Uh, why are they holding so hard, so holding on so hard? Because I've seen other places, one of the examples I've given is in Washington, DC, they had a basketball team called the Bullets. And people realized in like, at the time, it was like nation's murder capital of the world or something that there was a lot of gun violence and that to have a team that perpetuated this idea of, of violence and gun violence in particular was problematic. And so there was no disputing it. Everybody was on board. Let's change it to the bullet, Let change it to whatever. I think they turned it to the Washingtons or whatever. But there was no dispute in that. There was no pushback on that. Why did people push back so hard and hold on to these racist mascots. Do you have any comment to that? I don't, other than um, I can think of a couple of things. One is tradition. Tradition is so important to some people. And another thought is the current makeup of our country. The less white Anglo-Saxon Protestants we have in this country, and the more people of color we have, the greater there is fear of loss of control. And, um, and so I think that has something to do with it as well. There's another question in here from Michelle. What is the view from the Department of Education regarding mascots? Do you, do you know? I don't. We have talked to, I have talked to the um, Vermont Principals Association and they do not support mascots at all. However, their words got misconstrued in the news um, because they were asked to be the stick. They were asked to punish uh, schools that did not remove their offensive mascot by um, by not allowing them to play in games. And they were like adamantly opposed to becoming the punisher. And rightfully so, I totally understand that. But in no way, shape or form support mascots. And there are over 300 members of the Vermont Principals Association. So that says a lot there. I've not talked with anyone from the Department of Ed. I don't even know who to talk to in the Department of Ed. There's too many chiefs and not enough Indians there. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to use a, a pun, but. <laughs> Listen, uh, so the Department of Education is like, they, they want to give the other um, agencies like uh, superintendents agency and, and BPA and such, but I believe that there's a membership to that. Like you have to be part of a membership for that where everybody has to answer to the Department of Education. Also say par, um, in terms of um, the Board of Education, that changes, right? It, it right. changes often compared, right. uh, depending on who's in office. Uh, so those are appointed positions. And so that can be um, obviously a, a difficult- Which which yeah. is what S-139 is going for. They want the controlling agency to be the Board of Education, which are all appointed people and change with each governor. And I find that to be problematic as well. It's a little disconcerting to me that we could go through this over and over again with every new set of people we get. Yes. Um, but just so you know, the What's other happening thing in school boards, people are literally running so that they can change the mascot back to what they want, running for school board just for that purpose. Exactly. And um, the other thing with S39 that seems to bother me is the, oh, I lost it. Oh, it's, it's a bitch getting old. Don't go there. <laughs> um, it'll come back to me. But, oh, yeah, it's, it has, they want to go through the, the Board of Education, not the Department of Ed. And what I was thinking when I thought if they went through the Department of Ed, then there could be 
a punishment of sorts there. If after a certain amount of time, two, three years, they don't get rid of the mascot, reduce the amount of educational funding they get. And each year they don't continue to remove the mascot, reduce the amount of educational funding they get again. And if they continue to do that, the community is gonna be up in arms. And, but I don't know if that'll happen either. That's my thought and I shared it and they jumped all over me. So <laughs> so, so uh, Judy, Julie was asking for a clarification on something that you said. I think she was asking, please teach us, why is it okay to say too many chiefs? It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. <laughs> I, that's what I was saying. I was being sarcastic. Yeah. It isn't. No. It isn't. <laughs> it's one of those things like, uh, yeah, using it uh, to, to show the example and why we shouldn't use it. Right. Um, anybody have any other um, questions for Judy today? Uh, Michelle. Well, just not a well, a comment and a question. So I just wanted to thank Judy for today. Um, I, I, I was an art educator, started in 2000 and met her when the Vermont art teachers used to meet yearly. And she was at the conference and um, was such an inspiration. And I used the lessons that she shared in my classroom. And uh, it's just interesting, you know, um, looking at the books and, and um, things that she shared. I remember that book, uh, the rabbit book. And I remember seeing it in the library and um, and so I think it would be interesting to do an audit on, on children's picture books. And I know I, I was on the Hartford uh, uh, school board for four years and a member of the Hartford um, uh, Committee for Race and Equity. And we actually um, hired someone to come in and do uh, create a strategic plan for the school and select board. And um, you know, we have a lot of great members on that um, committee and, and one woman went through and created a resource library for educators, which was really wonderful. And so I, you know, I, and now we have an equity coordinator, but um, it's overwhelming for, her. you know, she's just one person and she just needs a lot of support. And, um, but, but I wish I had had something like that when I was teaching art because I remember I would start to teach something and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is the right way to teach it. Am I, you know, I mean, there was, there was no one to talk to. There was no other colleague to, you know, and the only, and thank goodness I, I had that resource of Judy. But when I think about that in the state, you know, it would be really great to have resources for educators and to have people who, who can help them if, a school doesn't have an equity coordinator, you know, to have something that's, you know, that resource statewide and to have it supported by people so that educators can say, uh, you know, and I know that the Vermont State Library, um, we had an awesome librarian who unfortunately left, but um, he was great. And, uh, but he created a wonderful resource library too. And, and I think just, um, you know, getting the word out to people and educators and community members, you know, on top of like advocating for bills and things like that would be really helpful. And I, you know, and I know that um, I, I, again, I struggled through teaching and, and trying, <laughs> trying to bring um, uh, equity and diversity into my classroom. And, and sometimes I cringe going, Oh God, you know, but hopefully I cause, um, I didn't cause any harm, you know, when I did that. And um, I just appreciate the conversation today. And Judy, one thing I know is I cannot remove um, birch bark off a tree. I've never forgotten that. Not <laughs> if you don't want to kill it. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle. Michelle, nice to see you again. Um, Good to see you. Yeah, I yeah. put a little statement there for you, a little message for you. There's another question in the chat. Wait, I want to. I want to respond to. Oh, okay, Michelle. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. That's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Michelle, um, 
I am teaching a class right now with Shelburne, two women from Shelburne Farms every second Tuesday of the month. And what we're developing, it, we're calling it a class, it's three credits, teachers can get three credits for it, but it's more like a workshop. So in the beginning of the class, we give you all the meats and potatoes on a specific subject. At the end of the class, we learn from the teachers and we say, what didn't we give you that will help you to teach this subject? because together we're writing essential understandings to help all teachers teach native history in this state. And each class is going to be a different essential understanding. Um, and so I do have programs and um, written published papers on culturally appropriate art activities and how to tell the difference in children's literature and things like that, that if anybody contacts me, I'd be happy to share with. Um, and just, I just wanted to let you know that there are classes going on where we're working on creating that because I, having taught for 35 years plus, I know it's hard to be told to teach something that you have no resources on. So we're trying desperately to create those for you. Thanks, Michelle, for bringing that up. So it looks like there's another question in here that says, once a school, this is from Jen, once a school gets rid of a native mascot splash name, how would you like to see the Native American history of Vermont honored? Land acknowledgements. Land acknowledgements are protocol, everyday protocol for a Native American. It's that connection with land that tells the story. Being able to read the land and understand that we are one with the land and, and we are the land and what we do to the land, we do to our South. Um, and the history, that's another class I teach, the history of land acknowledgements. Um, so the history of land acknowledgement is is such that you honor the land and you honor those who cared for it. And by honoring those who cared for it, you have to do the research and figure out who they were. And you have to figure out all the hardships they've gone through to care for the land. And so land acknowledgements are clearly the way to go. And I just want to acknowledge that we weren't able to do a, a land acknowledgement today. Um, but Judy and I have already discussed um, how we plan on collaborating for another teaching or another workshop like this, uh, specifically surrounding land acknowledgements. <laughs> but we did talk about how it's snowing right now, Judy. We talked about that. Yeah, it's snowing here. <laughs> um, Okay, you're answering my question with the resources available for teachers, thanks. Okay, Jen, uh, so glad that the Art Educators, yeah, the Art Educators Association is great. Um, it's a great way to reach people about culturally appropriate native art. And um, I used to be there at their programs often. Um, yes, I think of how many do not know true history of the land. It's so true. You know, the land has impacted, you know, how many people and who in our communities went to boarding schools, how many people and who was impacted by eugenics. Um, the story of the land is all wrapped up in that history. And, um, and so if you learn how to properly do a land acknowledgement, you need to research that history and um, the land you're standing on. So I think that's a great way to do it. Um, is it inappropriate to institute a land acknowledgement while the school district still has a racist mascot? Ooh, and that's a challenging question. <laughs> Um, I have been working with a lot of school districts. Um, uh, and what area, what 
geographical area are you from? I'm in Rutland, soon to be a former school board member. Okay. Um, and so I asked this, I'll give you the reason why I asked this is because um, we were going to um, discuss, and we briefly did a um, declaration of inclusion, and some of us thought, I'm not talking about this in this climate, so we dropped that. So that's where my question comes from. Yeah, and and I and I'm sure that land acknowledgement would be taken the same way. But um, do you know? I think it's called Rutland Northwest School District. Is that right? Or North? It's uh, Brandon area. Sitting in. So I did a land not. I did a land acknowledgement class for their whole school board. 17 people showed up for all three classes and not one of them knew whose homeland they were on. So it's really important history and it's really important work to figure that all out. But if the mindset's not there, you'd be doing it to close minds. And what if their schools, that should be his. A totem pole. It used to have a totem pole out front, and it's they called Mushroom. Yeah, and it's not called Mushroom, and they didn't even know the land they're on. So yeah, so. and in their gym, they had a huge native headdress, right? Um, I know the totem pole was a gift from a native man that lived down the road. He made it for them. That's why they didn't want to get rid of it because I've talked to them about it. But you're absolutely right. They the um, the, the headdress, the paint, Plains Indian that's painted in the gym was done by a teacher and I spoke with him about it. And I haven't been back, so I'm not sure what happened, um, whether it was covered over or not, but I have tried, Alicia, um, to talk to them about those two things. Because oh, no, it's gone. It's that that is no longer. I live across the street from Neshabi. I was PTO there for about fourteen years, and it's been gone for a while. The the totem pole or the painting? No, the totem pole is still there. The painting is gone. Yeah. See, I spent some time talking to that because it was so confusing. They had a northwestern totem pole. They had a plains Indian painted on the wall, and their name Neshabi is an Abenaki word that means full of water because of all the rivers around there. And so I'm like, okay, so what message are you trying to say here that this is a conglomerate of a ton of different Indians, you know? <laughs> and so I have talked to them about that and they, that I understand what they're saying about the totem pole. It was a gift to some, from some man that lived down the road, he made it for them. So it puts it, puts it in kind of a hard spot because they accepted the gift. Um, but the, I did talk with the teacher who painted the headdress and I talked with the school about the headdress and I'm glad to hear that it's down. Good. Thanks. Well, I think too, Judy, it just is sad because you're saying they didn't even know the land, right? But yet they're trying to represent through these different ways. It's what you said. It's all that education. It so they is. They think they know, but then when you, you go and do a land acknowledgement, they don't even understand what the history of the land. It's right. back to that kind of level of education. Exactly. It is. It's so basic, isn't it? Well, basic, but you know, as I'm sitting here listening, I want to thank everyone for this discussion. I think it, it reminds me too of all the things around immigration and, and the refugees. And I think people don't know the history of land, like Rutland was, you know, immigrants. And so when I always confused me why they didn't want to welcome refugees, but it's the same idea. I think we just need to go back and really get educated about the history. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. And, um, and like I said, you can run across a hundred Swedish people with a hundred opinions and a hundred native people with a hundred opinions. And so you have to do your homework on who educates too. Very true. Because I heard that Rutland had some quote unquote native people speak and that they supported uh, mascots. Um, who knows where they're from? It wasn't their homeland because their homeland is the Mohegan. 
And I know they did not talk. We did so, have a national organization come and make a statement uh, about, about um, mascots honoring um, natives instead of denigrating. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, confusion and people want to hear what they want to hear, right? So, exactly. Exactly. Um, but here's the thing, like you need to listen to the people who live in your community and then also recognize what these, like the whole presentation that we have been through, how this imagery affects the psychological, has a psychological impact on our children. Right. And that's all, it. And all all children. There's no more to be said. If it has a psychological impact on our children, then it must, it must not, it must not be there. It must not exist anymore. Right. If we want to move forward. So and all the latest research I've shared with senators and reps on these two bills that are working on them, the latest res, re, uh, research that was gathered and put together in a paper by Laurel. Davis Delano, she lives in uh, Springfield, Mass. Um, it's amazing. It all shows how damaging it is to children, psychologically and emotionally. Um, it fills a void to create the racist environment that some people want and crave. And it, it, it hurts indigenous people. And, and our, and all non-indigenous as well right as we said and you know judy maybe when we mail we're going to send this uh, video we're coming towards the end um but we're going to send this we're going to put this video up on our youtube channel and we're going to share it i want to share it to all schools as well and administrators but we're going to also i would love to share it with our members i would love to show that paper from Laurel it, with your permission or with Laurel's permission. Yeah, let's do it with her permission. With Laurel's permission. So hopefully we can do that as well. Um, final, final like call for any other questions for Judy while we have her. This is so valuable. And I'm just so honored that you um, have agreed to speak today. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. It's nice to see all these beautiful faces so early in the morning. <laughs> It has been a great conversation, Julie. Thank you. Well, okay, everyone. It looks like we're we're we've just had a really lovely conversation. A lot of education here. Let's spread it around. Let's do that community organizing that Judy was talking about. Get our community on board because, like she said, we are stronger in numbers. You cannot break us if we have numbers, and we can educate. Uh, on how this is really harmful. And I know really at the end of the day, none of us wants to harm children, whether we're white, black, or brown, or however we show up, we do not want to hurt children. And so that's the, that is the, the thing that I take away from today, that we all have that commonality regardless, that we don't want to hurt children. And by doing this, we are hurt by not eliminating racist imagery from our society in, in general, we are harming ourselves and our children. So if we eliminate them, we will, we will make progress and move forward. So no you know, harm ever, said Alicia. That's right to children. You know, um, our most precious gift in this world is our children. And we need to treat them that way. I can't even think of a better way to end. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good weekend, everybody. You too.